The reading is taken from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. And that can be found on page 1014 of the Red Bible. It's Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up, ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is God, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked round and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields along with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our great God and heavenly Father, we bow before you indeed as our King, that you are not only the ruler of this world, but you're the ruler of the entire universe. All 100 billion galaxies are held in the palm of your hand. And Father, we thank you that you are so kind as to deign to speak to us and to speak to us so wonderfully and so clearly in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray that as we turn to his words this morning, by your Holy Spirit, you would speak into each one of our hearts, and you would be exalted, and you would be enthroned in each one of our hearts today. For your name's sake. Amen. Amen. Well, please do be seated. Do turn to that uh, reading we had from Mark chapter 10 on page 1014 in the Church Bibles. Now, I'm sure that you've come across this question, which you sometimes see in department stores, especially around Christmas time. What do you give the man who has everything? The answer, a woman to show him how everything works. <laughs> now, that's true, isn't it, guys? Because we never read the instructions, so we do need a woman to show us how everything works. Well, in the episode in the life of Jesus we're looking at this morning, it's about a man who appears to have everything. He has the three R's in abundance. He's rich, verse 22, having great wealth. He's religious, verse 17, because he's concerned with eternal life. And he's righteous, verse 20. So whichever commandment you may care to name, he has kept it. And so he can be pretty well pleased with himself. However, for all of that, there was one question which was burning deep in his heart. And he wanted the answer. It's the question about obtaining eternal life. And that's equivalent to the kingdom of God, verse 23, and salvation, verse 26. But you see, to any onlooker, it was pretty obvious that if anyone was going to get eternal life, it was this man. 
He had so much going for him. And so it appears that his question is rather redundant. But it obviously isn't to him. It's deeply significant. Hence him running up to Jesus. Did you notice that? He wants to get hold of Jesus before he leaves town. And then he gets down on his knees before Jesus in the dirt. And that would have been a first. So you can imagine these shockwaves reverberating through the crowd when Jesus appears to set the bar of entry into the kingdom of God so high that the man simply walks away. Now our church Bible translates his reaction in verse 20 as going away sad. And so maybe eliciting our sympathy. But the word is much stronger than that. It's better translated grieved, which, as we shall see in a moment, is very significant. And it's significant because it exposes his fundamental problem, which might also be your fundamental problem. So what's going on? After all, you might say, but I thought Jesus accepted everybody unconditionally. It certainly doesn't look like that here. Because here, Jesus sets this condition of selling everything. So does Jesus accept everybody unconditionally, as is often asserted today? Well, yes and no. Yes, in that Jesus does accept us unconditionally, in that we do not have to be a certain type of person to come to him. You can be of any class, you can be of any color, you can be of any creed, you can be a sinner or a saint if you like. You see, he does not lay down the kind of preconditions we might lay down before we accept people. But the answer is no, in that we can't remain as we are, as if there's no cost or change involved. It's been said that the entrance fee into the Christian faith is free. The annual subscription is everything. And that was the lesson this man and his disciples were about to learn. Now, in order to properly understand what the big issue really is, Jesus demolishes his basic assumption that many people have and many religions promote concerning how we are put right with God and how we enter into the blessings of eternal life. Now, you see the assumption right there at the beginning in verse 17. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the problem with this outlook that there is something good we can do, which somehow qualifies us to eternal life, is that we have fairly ropey standards as to what goodness is. You see, when we say, or at least think, I am good, who are we comparing ourselves with? Now, often it will be someone down here on the relative scale of goodness, won't it? Compared to Adolf Hitler, I am good. So what? Anybody can say that. But is that the right standard? You've got to ask this question. What is the universal standard of goodness against which we're all to be measured? Well, Jesus implies it there in verse 18. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Now, what is Jesus' point? Well, let me ask, where do we get this sense of right and wrong from? So that we can actually say with absolute confidence that torturing babies is not just distasteful, it is wrong, it is evil. The answer is that it comes from a being. A being whose character is pure goodness. So that which runs counter to that character is wrong, And that which is in line with that character is good. But it may also be that Jesus is actually alluding to his own divinity here. Why do you call me good when God alone is good? 
Now, Jesus is not saying, steady on, old chap, you've got me all wrong. I might be fairly decent, but the epithet good is reserved for God alone. He's the measure of all goodness. Look at what he says, not me. Now, rather, it could be something along these lines. Yes, only God is good. And you recognize that kind of goodness in me. That's why you're asking me these sort of questions. So why not do some joined up thinking? God is good. I am good. I am. You've got it. And in a moment, Jesus is going to make such an outrageous demand that it has all the hallmarks of a divine demand. You see, it's no good looking down for a standard of goodness by which we to measure ourselves. Because when that happens, all we do is end up deluding ourselves into thinking that we're better than we actually are. No, you don't look down, you look up. And when you do that, kneeling in the dirt with this man looking up at Jesus, then you see a standard which keeps you down on your knees. What was it the Russian writer Dostoevsky said? I believe that there is nothing lovelier, deeper, more sympathetic, more rational, more manly, and more perfect than the Savior. I say to myself with jealous love that not only is there no one else like him, but that there could be no one. And you know, Jesus is about to get this man not only to see that, but to feel it. And so in effect, Jesus says to him, look, you know that God is the measure of all goodness. And he's given us some indication of what that goodness looks like in practice, in his commandments. And so Jesus appears to make it rather easy for him at first. He just names the second list of the Ten Commandments to do with relationships. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. You are to honor your mother and your father. And when the man says, look, I've kept all these things from when I was a boy, from my bar mitzvah, if you like, Jesus doesn't cast doubt on his claim. No, he points out that there's something missing. And that is when Jesus delivers his knockout punch. One thing you lack, one thing. Go, sell everything. Give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now that sounds pretty hard. Crippling, in fact. But please notice the manner in which Jesus delivered the challenge. He looked at him, and he loved him. He really did love this man. He wasn't going to grind his nose into the dirt, raising the bar so high that he he, he sees it as an impossibility and takes joyful glee in pointing it out, saying, oh, I bet you didn't see that one coming, did you? No, he loved him. And because he loved him, he wanted the best for him, which God, of course, always wants for us. And so he lays out the stark truth. So here's the question. Why did Jesus say what he said? Nowhere else in the Bible is that demand made of anybody else. Well, the fact that Jesus makes the demand at all tells us something very special about Jesus. Uh, One German scholar, a man called Martin Hengel, has surveyed how all other rabbis of the time of Jesus called their disciples after them. And he's found that nowhere, nowhere, does anyone do it like Jesus. In fact, he points out that the way Jesus calls the disciples parallels the way God calls the prophets in the Old Testament. There's something divine about the way Jesus calls people. 
He acts as if he has every right in the world to do it. And he expects an immediate response. God can do that, you know. You see, Jesus knew what the man's real problem was. He may have appeared to love other people, probably did. He no doubt gave a good proportion of his wealth away to the poor as any good Jew would. But Jesus, you see, saw that the first great commandment was not being carried out, loving God with everything, God with everything. And why? Because there was another God in this man's life, the God is called wealth. Is eternal life the most important thing? If, then, if so, then surely if the offer is being made to you to take it, then actually it makes sense to give up everything for it. But not for this man, and not for many of our contemporaries. And the fact that Jesus had put his finger on a sore spot is indicated by the young man's response. At this, his face fell. We would say the bottom of his world fell out. And then he went away grieved. Now, why? Because we're told he had great wealth. Now, why is that response significant? Well, this is the way Tim Kelly describes what's going on in the man's heart. He says there's a place where the same Greek word is applied to Jesus. Matthew records in his gospel that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus started to sweat blood as he grieved in deep distress. Same word. Why? He knew he was about to experience the ultimate dislocation, the ultimate disorientation. He was about to lose the joy of his life, the core of his identity. He was going to lose his father. Jesus was going to lose his spiritual center, his very self. When Jesus called this young man to give up his money, the man started to grieve because his money was for him while the father was for Jesus. It was the center of his identity. To lose his money would be to lose himself, to lose what little sense he had of covering the stain, the sin. Do you see? In short, his problem, which in various degrees is our problem, is idolatry. Now, in this man's case, it was uh, his idol, his God substitute, was riches. But it could easily have been something else. It could have been pleasure. It could have been sex. It could have been a career. It could have been a thousand and one other things, which in themselves are good, but which become bad when they do not occupy their rightful place in our lives, but occupy God's place. And the one true God in Jesus Christ says, no, that is not right. It is not good, no matter what veneer, religious veneer you may smear over it. And what is more, and this is why he loves this young man, he says, what is more, it's not good for you. Because while something else is your God, whatever is your dream, whatever else gives you joy and power without God and excludes God, then you can never know the real God and therefore eternal life. But the idol of riches had such a grip on this man's soul that the thought of losing it was all too much. And so he walked away from the only hope he had of eternal life. And that is tragic. You know, there's such a thing as cheap grace. It was a term coined by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian who was hanged by the Nazis during the final days of World War II. In his book, Christian, The Cost of Discipleship, it makes the distinction between cheap grace and costly grace. Cheap grace offers forgiveness without repentance. 
grace without discipleship. So your sins can be forgiven without having to, them to be forsaken. And this is the false, unconditional love people speak about. Jesus accepts you as you are, and you know what? You can stay as you are. And this is the stuff and nonsense being spoken by those in the church who wish to condone homosexual behavior. But it is a cheap grace, and it is no grace at all. But true grace, on the other hand, is costly. And it is costly, as we're going to celebrate in a minute, because it cost Jesus his life on the cross. And it costs us our lives in day-to-day obedience. This is how Bonhoeffer describes it. The only man or woman who has the right to say that he is justified by grace alone is the man who has left all to follow Christ. Those who try to use this grace as a dispensation from following Christ are simply deceiving themselves. And that's right. Now the disciples recognize that. Who can be saved? Well, God, uh, Jesus reassures them, with God nothing is impossible. Anybody can be saved. Peter speaks, of, we've left everything to follow you. Yes, we, we see costly grace. So let me ask you, what kind of grace are you living by? Is it cheap grace? You want Jesus as your savior, but not as your ruler. If so, you're deceiving yourself. And the test is this. Are there things in your life that you will not let go even though Jesus says you must? Or things you would not contemplate of letting go even if Jesus said you should? Real grace is costly grace. However, while what Jesus demands of us may seem great, it is nothing compared to what he offers in return. Now, you know, sometimes uh, Christianity is dismissed as pie in the sky when you die. That's not what Jesus says here. There are plenty of rewards in the here and now for those willing to follow him. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, along with persecutions, costly grace. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. If someone were to ask me, what is one of the great things about being a Christian? I would not hesitate in saying, having fellowship with other Christians. It never ceases to be a source of amazement and pleasure to go to any part of the world and have that special oneness with with brothers and sisters. I know uh, the team uh, who went to South Africa discovered that for themselves a few weeks ago. Now, I've I've got Christian friends all over the globe, and some are like mothers to me, and I love them. Some of of them are like fathers to me, and I deeply respect them. Others are just terrific brothers and sisters. It's a family which crosses all borders, cultures, backgrounds, and languages. And it's a sheer delight, and there's nothing on earth that can compare with it. And best of all, is belonging to a fellowship like this and experience that very thing Jesus speaks of here week in, week out. But the best is still future. The age to come. That's where you get eternal life. And it's something we're going to enjoy together. Hence all this family talk by Jesus of fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters. This is how the 18th century American theologian Jonathan Edwards describes what it's going to be like in heaven. I think it's beautiful. The God who dwells and gloriously manifests himself there is infinitely lovely. 
There's to be seen a glorious heavenly father, a glorious redeemer. There's to be felt and possessed a glorious sanctifier, the Holy Spirit. All persons who belong to that blessed society are lovely. The father of the family is so, and so are all his children. And friends, that is why it really isn't a cost at all to give up everything for Jesus. Because in Jesus, you gain everything. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we thank you for your kindness, for your willingness to speak the truth to us, and it is a truth which sets us free. Father, we pray that in our own hearts we would not trade costly grace for cheap grace, but embrace the cost as we see it in Christ, and by your Spirit live it out day by day. And Father, we thank you so much for each other for this family, for all the wonderful things you give to us in each other. And we want to bless you now. Amen.